Welcome to The Long Road. My name is Chris Roberts. I'm here with my two guests. Alan Camille, Principal at Keene High School. And Leslie Farmer, Athletic Director at Keene High School. And this is a repeat of, of last fall. Last fall we came in to talk about a student athletes at Keene High School. And it was well received. And so looking at it, doing again the uh, update of the athletic program at the high school. And <clears throat> to me as we talked before is when I think a well-rounded education still includes athletics. A lot of people don't think so, but I think you learn a heck of a lot and there's a lot of character development on the athletic fields. And so <clears throat> can you give me an update on what some of the things are happening at the high school? Uh, well, I think one of the interesting things, Chris, when you talked about that, if you look at uh, Fortune 500 companies, they talk about the importance of uh, people they hire <coughs> Uh, having a strong extracurricular background, whether it be plays or athletics or whatever it is, but they want to see them doing something more than just going to school. So that kind of piggybacks on what you just said. And um, we have brought about a lot of new things over the last year since we were here. But uh, we truly do believe in the athletic world that um, athletics is the fifth block of the day at Keene High School. Uh, the first four are completely academic educational, and the fifth block is athletic and educational as well. And, uh, and we're very excited. The Student Athlete Leadership Council has really taken off over the last 12 months, Chris. Um, it's increased in size. It's increased in activity. It's had some great things going on. It's working really well with the Student Council, the Renaissance Council. Um, and I think we've really started to turn the culture and the sportsmanship of students at Keene High School, which is what the mission is of the Student Athlete Leadership Council. We had one, um, <clears throat> Kelly Steiner, with the um, <clears throat> anti-drug and anti-substance abuse program. And one of the things that just seems to be popping up more and more is the kids are now getting it. That steroids, those performance-enhancing drugs, that was a losing long-term proposition and they're no longer idolizing the drug takers they now want to go clean well we've had some interesting <clears throat> speakers last spring uh, with the help of Paula Jessup and uh, who owns Amici's Pizza we had Travis Roy as a guest speaker that was the hockey player that yeah, is the, that is the, the ice man, hockey player yeah. he in the uh, in the first this 11 team. seconds of his first game as a freshman at Boston University <laughs> And he was powerful. I mean, just powerful. Absolutely um, very calm, very poignant, very um, deliberate in what he had to say. And I thought his message was really quite good. Talking about life choices, about, you know, the choices you make can influence you. And uh, like he said, uh, I made a choice to play hockey. I made a choice to do this. And I did nothing wrong. I look where I'm sitting here. So you can make some other choices that are self-destructive. And we also had Ed Garrity last year from uh, Mrs. Farmer's group. Uh, he talked about you know positive image, making right choices. And who was the gentleman we just had, Mr. Harris? And we just had William Harris, who's out of Middlebury, Vermont, who um, talked about where do you fit on the motivation chart? Are you self-motivated? Are you willing to be motivated? Or are you unable to be motivated and that you should always if you fall down or get knocked down look up get up and never give up and I think the other thing was when when you talk when Miss Farmer's talking about her leadership uh, council uh, we have freshman orientation day which has been very successful the last five years and uh, we have some team building games that uh, we have those students do uh, with their advisors who they're going to be with for the next four years and that was run all by student athletes in their uh, I was in there for, gosh, I bet you about an hour, and uh, they ran the whole thing. And it's one thing to run it, but it's one thing to encourage the freshmen to be positive. It's another thing to encourage uh, certain students that are kind of shy and backing off, and they just did a wonderful job. And so, <clears throat> for example, football team. Football team went extremely well last year. Mm -hmm. And if we, if we want to be honest, when you, you look at Keene, you're not going to be producing globs and globs of Division I football players. The kids, are, we just don't have, <clears throat> like if you go down to Boston, B.C. High, mm -hmm. when you get guys linemen at six foot nine, right. 270 pounds at, at, at 10th grade. But you still produce a highly competitive with great sportsmanship teams. Well, I attribute that <clears throat> to 
the fact that I really believe that we have a very strong staff of coaches. Um, they're positive. They work well together. Uh, they've been in their mm. positions for a little oh, bit okay. of time, which makes a huge difference. So now they're able to develop some consistency. Uh, we did have quite a few turnovers <laughs> last spring. However, I truly believe we filled all those positions with people who are going to make a difference, mostly and most importantly, in the lives of student athletes, but also in the programs that we offer. And uh, I'm really excited ab about the staff. And I, I think one of the things uh, Ms. Farmer alluded to, once you establish the culture of what you expect at your school, you can change coaches, but if that culture has been established, it, it continues on. And I think part of that is uh, our student athletes interview the interview the coaches. So uh, we're looking for a good fit not only for their uh, their knowledge of the sport, but we're looking a good fit of how they interact with students, and we're also looking for a good fit how they interact with our school. So I, I think that's why we've been successful. Well, and the other piece is that when they sit on that interview committee, it's very important for them to know that their vote is exactly the same weight as anyone else's vote. And their input is just as important as the input of the adults that are sitting in the room as well. And you're talking about the coaches and, and the culture. The unfortunate part when we go around the country, whether it's Miami, Ohio State, or some of the other ones, it's win at any cost, use the student up, yes. athlete at any cost. And we don't have that in Keene High. We don't have that with coaches. We have coaches that seem to be, and I have no question about it, they're worried about the development and the long-term growth of our young men and young women that go to the high school. Student-centered would be the best way to explain Student -centered it. Student-centered is exactly yep. the best way. Um, one of the mission statements is athletes first and winning is second. And that applies to high school. And that, that is not only in Keene, in the mm -hmm. state, but it's also nationally, Chris, through the NFHS, that it's athletes first and winning is second. And that's important. Yeah. It's very important. And you alluded at the beginning how many, how many students from the time they start junior high to high school ever make it to Division One, and then how many make it. And it's, the number is, is pretty outstanding where people think it's pretty easy to make, and it's not easy to make. It's number one if you have the talent, but it's number two if you're in the right place at the right time. So I think what our folks do is they don't go from the thing we're going to establish you as, as a Division One athlete. We're going to establish you as the best athlete that you can be. And before we go back to the football, we'll go, since you have Swamp Bat Purple on today. I do. And <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. There's no problem. They, you know, they were a championship team. They gave it a perfect example of what sportsmanship is, is all about. And one of the questions that they had was um, which kid had grad was um, drafted by the um, baseball team but decided to go back to college. So my daughter called me up, and so I'm – trying to Google it so she get the answer. And I didn't realize that 1,500 high school kids get drafted every year by Major League Baseball organizations, and only about 50 of them make it. Mm -hmm. And right. that's for even some of those 50 I just come up in September yep. and that one time around. And so if you put all your dreams on that, you're going to have, chances are you're going to have a highly frustrated yep. life. And so... Yeah, it is so extremely important. Ed athletics is great, but education is far more important. And I think you have to educate those student athletes on what their chances are. You know, and sometimes it's it's a heartbreaker, but you have to you have to be really honest with them. I think we do a nice job <laughs> with that. Um, Kim Baker, who is the department chair for guidance, uh, and I in March we run a wonderful NCAA workshop. It's free um, to any high school, freshman, sophomore, junior, because usually a senior is already committed by March. And it talks about the NCAA and Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three. Last year we had a panel. A nice gentleman, Jay Hauser from uh, Concord, comes down and conducts this workshop, and parents and students can ask questions. And it really lets them know that the funnel gets really small when you go from elementary to middle to high school to college to professional, okay? It just really begins to narrow down. He does a nice job of being upfront and honest with them mm -hmm. so that they don't have any false expectations. And 
my, my grandson plays baseball, and he's only 10 years old, and, and there's four teams, and I'm looking at the teams, there's, there's 60 kids, and it just pop. It's like the parents are saying, yeah, and how great their kids are, but automatically, 45, if everything went along, 45%, 45 of those kids, or 75%, would never be able to right. wear a keen mm-hmm. high um, baseball uniform yep. because of the way the funnel stri- mm-hmm. shrinks down. And then once, once they go from high school into college, it gets even more <laughs> yeah. restrictive yeah. and more restrictive and more restrictive. Okay, so let's go back to the good stuff. Okay, okay. let's go back to the, football. Yeah, the football. How do you think the football team is going to do this year? I think the football team is going to do very well this year. Yeah, they they were very impressive in the first game where they lost to Salem. Uh, very good football team. They did an outstanding job. They did a great job in uh, in their win the week before. And and you know John Lupa does a does a good job with those kids. You don't see our kids get rattled when things get tough, and that that's part of his personality that comes through to the team. Uh, you don't see him get frustrated. Uh, you know, especially when you look at the the one win they had where they they run. You know, they score right coming out of half, and that could be a downer. But uh, they do a nice job. And, and I'll tell you, I've been in six high schools. We've got good kids. Our, our students are, are good kids. Good. Now, the, the people that we pay like $190,000 for the lights, what is they, has that benefited the school? Oh, gosh, yes. Oh, it's, yes. Uh, it's, it's, just a, it's just a whole different atmosphere and a whole different feeling. I came from the Midwest, and you never played on Saturday. I mean... There were some small high schools of 92 kids in the entire high school, and they would have lights. And uh, when I first came out here to the east, and I saw nobody had lights up there, it's just not the same. It's just not the same. We even, when I was head football coach in Wisconsin, we went up to Iron Mountain, Michigan, and we had to leave uh, early on Friday because uh, they play on Friday nights, and they wouldn't even think about changing to uh, Saturday because yeah, it's. It, I think it gives more people in the community a chance to come out. It's more of a relaxed atmosphere, you know, on a Saturday. If the game starts at 12 or 1 o'clock, you might find six or seven things to do, and by the time you're doing them, if you're well, it's too late to go. Well, this is this is a big evening. I know the, the first home game, we ran out of hot dogs, hamburgers, and pizza <laughs> by halftime. Of, they, so. they ran out of everything, okay, yeah. and they thought they had more than enough. And um, the one thing that has done, because my high school was brand new, and <laughs> I didn't play Friday night football. I didn't cheer for Friday <laughs> night football. It has brought out... A huge number of students, a tremendous number of students, which is great. Okay, so the birdcage, which is what we call the student section, is just getting bigger and bigger each week. It's absolutely wonderful. And in the first, um, not the Labor Day game, but the the first game after school started, uh, our band director Rick Anderson had to be away for the weekend, so the middle school band director came, <laughs> and he directed our band. So we had a band there, the pep band, and the kids were there, and uh, and there's a whole group of alumni, I mean, more mature alumni, who come and they have like their seats. <laughs> they sit right under the press box, and that's where they sit, and it's an evening out for them, and and they just love it. And it's just exciting. There's something yeah, exhilarating about playing yeah. under the lights. Yeah. It's just... And plus, if you're a football player and it's cold and damp, you enjoy a little bit more when the stands are packed. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, God, yes, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, football's not the only fall sport. Nope. Nope, we have two soccer teams. We have a brand-new coach at uh, boys soccer he's doing very well his name is ryan moore he's an alumnus of Keene high school and uh he's just excited i mean he, he he's excited they haven't started off really well because they're in the strongest part of their of their schedule. schedule and um he's still excited because he knows the softer side of the schedule is coming up, and and the kids are, are ready. Now that they've been through the tough stuff, they'll be ready. They'll, they'll be looking for the roadblocks. Um, we also have a new coach at girls volleyball, Stacy Brannon. She's doing a great job, absolutely a great job. And she brings with her college experience, which is wonderful. And she was in the program last year. Right? And she was in the program last year as a JV coach, as was Michelle Tiani, as a JV coach who moved up to varsity on a temporary basis last year, uh, she and Jay Punt simply switched places last year, and uh, now she's at the helm full time. So, but she's been with the program for a while. Stacy's been with the program. Ryan Moore is a product of the program and played in college and played professionally after he graduated from college, and now is back in the area and. It, 
Ed just brings a wealth of experience. It's wonderful. So I can say they're doing well. They're doing very well because we have great kids. Mm -hmm. We absolutely have, Chris, wonderful kids. And cross country? Well, they're doing very well, I guess. Um, Nashua South is the first big invitational that they've been at. And I honestly have not had a chance to check the standings from Nashua South on Saturday for the boys or the girls. But uh, they both participated in this. This was the first year that Nashua South had an invitational for cross country. And I think it's going to become an annual event. And it was a pretty big invitational. There were quite a few schools there. I'm a little biased. <clears throat> towards cross country because cross country is one of those great sports. It's also an individual standard, mm -hmm. but you can't win by, by yourself. yourself. Yeah. Right. And um, I ran cross country my senior year in high school. That was the first time. I won three races, but we lost every single match. And it's sometimes you would go and it's like you're counting the people and it's kind of like, man, I wish I could have gave some of my time to the fifth guy yeah. so you can yeah. win a, as a team. And so it, it just seems to be one of those sports that everyone's cheering on for each other. Yeah. Well, it's, that's very true. It is where um, everyone needs to run a personal best, and then it's an accumulation of everybody's best time in order to score the points for the team. That's a tough sport. And if you look uh, <laughs> at our girls, girls cross country, Chloe Molesky, yeah. who graduated last year as a Duke on a, on a scholarship, mm -hmm. which, is, which is phenomenal. I mean, that, that's when you talk about that funnel. But what helped turn the funnel was her grades. And that, that was a contributing <clears throat> factor. You know, you look at, at college athletes now, they're, they're not only just looking at their athletic ability, they're also looking at their academic ability. Because in a couple of years, college schools are going to be graded on not only how many they win and lose, but what their graduation rate is. And if their graduation rate is low, they're going to be penalized. The other piece that was important with Chloe is that she ran in the fall, she ran in the spring, she played basketball in the winter. So they actually could see her in a different sport yep. other than running. They could see how she related with the team, what was her footwork like, how did she relate with her coaches, um, what type of team player was she, and of course she's just a fabulous team player because she's a wonderful young lady. But I have to agree with Mr. Camille that her academics are really what took her to where she is. But going back, and one of the things that people used to say, and it, the research shows over and over, there's a lot of kids who would have dropped out mm -hmm. if they didn't have Absolutely. sports. And schools that have raised the academic requirement, the students, if they really want to play the sport, work harder. They respond. It's, yes, it's they a do. respond. And that's part of the athletic and character development. The standard gets higher, you work harder. Mm -hmm. And, and it's been found that that's very true. All right. I remember when um, we instituted the 1.67 in addition to mm -hmm. the state's mm -hmm. requirement for eligibility, and everybody was like, oh, boy. Can you explain what 1.67 is? 1.67 is a C minus average, and we expect our student athletes to <laughs> achieve and maintain a 1.67 or higher. And if they don't, we have an academic assistance program for them to help them to achieve a 1.67 and remain. And uh, the state requirement is lower than that. It's passing two classes that meet every day. And um, when we instituted the 1.67 level, in addition to the NHIA, everybody was like, oh, wow, here goes some of our student athletes. But it didn't happen. They stepped up to the plate, and they rose to meet the expectations. And they will. They'll rise to meet the expectations. Because athletics is it's also a peer peer pressure. It's a it's a social group. They grow together. You don't want to let down members of your peers. Well and and probably one of the best experiences, they're having fun. Okay? They're they're working hard, but they're having fun. They're enjoying each other's company. Um and they're enjoying the things they do uh, off the field, such as their team dinners and their team building activities, um, going to watch other athletic events, uh, going to other events, fundraising. They have to do a community service project as a group, as a program. So they get very involved and they know each other. They spend a lot of time with each other. And one of the other things Leslie started uh, four years ago was the, uh, the grade point average uh, 
dinners? Or awards? Why don't you explain those? Oh, the the um, student, student scholar athlete, athlete yeah. social for any student athlete who achieves a three point five or higher in the quarter in which they are actively involved in their sport. We have a uh, scholar athlete social evening, and um, we we recognize them. They get a certificate, and then we take the programs and we add the all of the. GPAs, whether that, it's a 3.5 yeah, right. or higher, it's the entire Every student team, that's on that team GPA. So they, mm -hmm. ma they everyone makes a contribution, and uh, the first three highest teams with a combined GPA earn um, very special, very selective <laughs> prizes. Number one team gets dinner for 24 at the Olive Garden, both in the fall, mm -hmm. the winter, and in the spring. And the Olive okay. Garden has supported that, and they pay for the tip also. They right? pay for everything. Everything. They give them a selected menu. They have, I believe, four or five things to choose from and a couple of appetizers. There's one dessert. They get the breadsticks and the, mm. the um, salad. refillable oh, salad, salad yeah. which is the best, and, uh, <coughs> and beverages, and then they do pay for the tax and the tip. Second place gets to go to Ted's with a gift card mm. and do a little shopping. Each mm. student athlete on that team will get a gift card for $10 for Ted's Shoe and Sport. He's a tremendous supporter of athletics. He's a tremendous supporter of the community. Mm. Not just Keene High School athletics, mm. but the community in general. Um, he's got his roots here. And added on last year, number three gets to go to Amici's and have, I believe she's going to change it this year. Last year, I believe it was a pizza with one topping of their choice mm. and a beverage. All right. And I know she's already talked to me about changing what the gift is, but not changing the fact that she wants to be a participant. And that's for every student. And that's for every, every uh, student. On, on a team. Um, no, every student that has a 3.5 okay. yeah. or higher. Not every student on a team. You have to have a 3.5 or higher to get the special reward. But, but when you look at that, that's a great community involvement for, you know, you look at Olive Garden, they're a national chain, but they still have to have a regional manager that accepts the idea. That's a gigantic financial commitment they make three times a year. TED's is another gigantic financial commitment. And, and if they didn't believe in the student athlete and they didn't believe in that marriage between athletics and academics, we wouldn't have that. And it makes... It makes a big difference when we get done and we, we call up the five top teams <laughs> and then we say now five is gone, four is gone, three is gone. There's a lot of excitement there. And they compete for that dinner. Yeah. Oh, they compete for that dinner. They, they talk about it throughout the whole season. Yeah. They, they want it, especially in the spring. It has gone back and forth between uh, girls track, girls tennis, and boys tennis. And um, it's, it's funny to watch how it travels, and they're like waiting on bated mm. breath, you know, to see who's going to get it. And it's it's actually incredible. But Mr. Camille's right; it's a really nice marriage um, between academics and athletics, and it really it really broadcasts that for people to see that athletics academics are linked. And the other thing you see is, even though our enrollment's going down, you see the the grade point average is starting to creep up, yes, which you talked about, and the participation is creeping mm. up also. You know, I spent a year in Japan, and it always used to amaze me in Japan with, with the schools, and most of their classes were with 32 students. And number one kid, part of his, the broken four-man team, got number 32 kid. And so they, so basically at the end, there's, they all had, quote, the same amount of points. But as the number one kid, you got part of your grade based on what you did, but you got part of your grade based on what your whole team did. Right. So the number one kid saying, well, you know what, I got to help number 32 so I can get better. I can get, so it's, it's like the, the team concept. If, right. if you get a couple of, I don't like to use weak, but not as great students, it's really in the, the, the top students and the team's benefit to help that other, one, other two to become a better team members. Well, it's like that slogan that your chain is only as strong as your weakest link. Okay, and that uh, you need to strengthen all your links mm -hmm. to make your chain strong. <clears throat> so it's not like we, when we were growing up and going to, you had the, the clicks on the team and everyone else was kind of like cannon fodder mm -hmm. that yeah. they ignored. Yeah. So it's, it's the really tight-knit team. I think we really promote that at Keene High School, Chris, <clears throat> to be honest with you. We promote that with the slogan that it's 20 sports, one team. That it's all one team. 
team representing Keene High School, whether you're playing lacrosse, you're playing football, you're wrestling, gymnastics, swimming, it's all one team representing Keene High School in 20 different sports. When you, <clears throat> to go back to Olive Garden and Ted and Amici, I don't think a lot of people understand how important it is for the community sponsors and involvement to really help to have a really dynamic athletic pro program because there's a heck of a lot more costs that are never covered in mm -hmm. the budget. Absolutely. I think it's one of the best mm. things that we've done yep. over the last five years. And last year we awarded each of those businesses with a plaque that they can hang mm. in, in their, their business, business that shows that they uh, support both academics and athletics at Keene High School and thanking them for their commitment to both. And so we'll go back to some of the other sports that we're having. Well, which ones would you like to know about? <laughs> You're the athletic director. You're well, the expert. <laughs> we're we wanna, good. We want to make sure all the sports. Right. There's no minor sports. They're all sports. Correct. They're all, they're all sports. Yeah. Last year in the winter, we had a wonderful showing with our ski teams, our alpine ski teams and our Nordic ski team. Um, this year, we have a new person at the helm of the Nordic ski team. Klaus Bayer is going to be taking over as the coach. And he and Ken Henninger have basically switched places. Okay. Um, it's this Klaus Bayer that Bayer? Klaus Bayer. He used to be at King State College? Yes. <clears throat> I had him as a freshman in geography. I won't say how many years mm -hmm. ago, but <laughs> <laughs> Klaus he, Bayer. He must be pretty active. He's you know <laughs> He is he is so wonderful with our student athletes. <clears throat> And they have so much respect for yeah, him. Yes, they do. And they, they just, they admire him and they adore him at the same time. And, uh, and I think they're a little envious that they can't <laughs> ski as well as he can. <laughs> I mean, he is a good <clears throat> skier. He is a strong technician. All right. And Ken is a tremendous wax artist. And in Nordic skiing, you have to have, you have two sets of skis one for classical, one for skate. You have different types of wax depending upon the snow, the weather, whether it's snowing when you're out there, if it's raining when you're out there, it's great. But the boys' alpine team won the um, Division I state championship. The girls' alpine team finished second as runner-up in the state championship. And the boys' Nordic team finished second in the team championship for Division I, all for Division I. Our bowling team, our 10-pin bowling team that everyone laughs at me. Which just started, what, two years ago? <laughs> two years ago because we created a 10-pin <clears throat> bowling team. But I'll be honest, bowling scholarships are plentiful across the country if you get out of New England. They are plentiful, all right? And there is a lady in Merrimack whose picture hangs at Indiana University in the Hall of Fame right next to Larry Bird's. <laughs> he was basketball. She's bowling. And um, they finished fourth uh, in, in the, it's just one division right now, all right, because it's still, uh, Keene High School is still a club. This is its third year as a club. And I don't think they care. They just like the fact that it is offered, and it is such an eclectic group of student athletes that might not have a fit somewhere right, else. That's the key. They, but they, have a tremendous fit Right, they have with a niche. And that they have a niche. And it's more students involved in and the experience, and I think that's great. When, when, when I was a small kid, I used to go bowling every Saturday. Back then, it was only a buck and a quarter for the, the league and three. But it kept me out of trouble. Mm -hmm. I was doing stuff on Saturday right. while other people were, doing <clears throat> were getting, other getting in trouble. And I just came across, run around the country, my 13,000-mile trip. <laughs> and these small towns all around the country there are bowling alleys, yep. and not only just bowling alleys, they're, they're community events. Right. And people get together. You go on a Saturday, it's, it's jam-packed. It's jam-packed, yeah. And, and those, those kids cheer on for each other, and they're, you know, it, it's an individual, like I said earlier, it's an individual sport that depends on a team score. And I actually bowled in a league <laughs> last winter. I... I decided I would do this. Yankee Lanes <clears throat> has been so generous and gracious with us with bowling. I said, I think I'll join a league, and I'll just see what this is like. I had a ball, and I have to be honest, it became more of a social event that I got to see people that I will never see in my everyday 
business at Keene High School, and um, and I got to meet people that I would not have met outside of Keene High School because I usually am at Keene High School. So it was a wonderful experience. And it was just a wonderful experience. And people don't realize how technical bowling is. You Very have to get your mathematical mm -hmm. skills down. Yeah, you just don't throw Where as hard as you can. Yeah. You can. Well, not only that, it's the weight of the ball, so the size of the holes for your fingers, the distance <coughs> apart, how you grip them. Um, and where do I, do I hit the pin this one, the yeah. slide what you do, What you do with your thumb as to whether or not the ball is going to go this way <coughs> or that way, and then your shoes. And then Believe you, you not, also have to shoes. gauge on how the, the alley Wax. is oiled. Yeah. Oil. Yes. Because yeah, some are oiled <coughs> different than others. Right, ones. and the spin. It's almost like cross-country skiing. Yeah. You have to be... Uh, yeah. cognizant of the, the terrain to, to wax your skis. And um, I had Ruth Sterling on last week for the Pumpkin Fest. Okay, good. And um, I told her that I would ask you guys because they're going to have pumpkin bowling and they're looking for some people to help out. And I said maybe the um, the team would might be interested. Oh. As I'll, a community. I'll have, to, I'll have to check that out. <clears throat> okay, I'll have to, to I'll have to put that up there because um, they're looking for that help fundraisers yeah. and some of the other organizations. Well, that happens to be one of the winter positions that at the moment we do have open. <clears throat> All right, our bowling coach had to step down due <clears throat> to personal yeah. reasons, and uh, I haven't advertised that <clears throat> yet. But I do have a person who's very interested and in the building, <clears throat> so perhaps she can help me to coordinate that. Yeah, and, um, <clears throat> Yeah, I guess they want to do it on West Street and looking for people that are a little knowledgeable in bowling, how to keep scoring. They kind of want to make it um, a competition. God, a bowling ball is going to blow those things apart. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I hope they have a pile of pumpkins. No, it's you're Rolling using the, the pumpkins. Oh! You're going to be using the, they're going, she's already got the pins, the 10 pins. And they're oh going my to have, Lord. and the idea is when Can you're you talking, imagine? you're talking about putting those <laughs> fingers in there and trying to figure it. And they, oh, is that funny? That's a not many to roll, is it? <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, that ought to be hysterical. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. She was I will. She had it. Yeah, she actually has all the ten pins. She went. Matter of fact, I think she said she went on eBay to buy in, about a hundred of them so they could have about ten lanes to have people going. Wow. Oh, isn't that fantastic? <laughs> Absolutely it, fantastic. So I said I'd talk to him. Maybe that'd be a possibility yeah. as a community involvement okay. one. All right. Our boys ice hockey team went to the <clears throat> postseason for the first time in six years. And I will brag about our boys mm -hmm. ice hockey team. They did not have one disqualification during the season. Not one. That's fantastic for a sport that is so contact-oriented mm -hmm. and so emotionally charged not to have one disqualification was wonderful, okay? And to make it to the postseason, they were on they were on fire. They were excited. And to watch them progress from game to Absolutely. game to game and watch them get better and better. But not only get better with their skills, but get better as a, as a group, uniting as a group. And, and hockey, like football, yeah, it's physical, it's emotional. Very physical. But that's no excuse for right. poor sportsmanship right. no. or taking cheap shots. Yeah. Yep. Um, we did have three coaches last year. We were really fortunate to have three <coughs> coaches selected as Coaches of the Year. Matt Schmidt was um, selected as Coach of the Year for Boys Soccer in Division I in the fall. Sean Darwin, our ice hockey coach, was selected as Coach of the Year for Ice Hockey in Division mm -hmm. II. And Matt Griffin was selected as Boys Lacrosse Coach of the Year in Division II, um, fall, winter, spring. I haven't seen a high school in a long time that has been that fortunate to have three, one for each, the yep. one for each season, okay, in one calendar year. And again, what people don't understand, when I was in Irvine, the, the football team, the coach was employed by the boosters, and the coach wasn't a teacher, and the coach was getting $60,000 a year. I don't think all your coaches to combine would get six thousand bucks a year. You don't pay them very much. Um, <laughs> it's a gratification <laughs> stipend. Yeah. Okay, based on all of the other things you get from coaching, other than money. Okay, the the fun, the satisfaction, um, the ability to strengthen yourself as a person, to strengthen student athletes as people, to develop character to institute all of the things that you feel um, are important about character building and your sports-specific sport. 
Um, so it, it was really quite an honor to have three in one yeah. year selected as coaches of the year. And really, when you look at these coaches, when you look at the cost, they're actually spending money out of their own pocket just for the privilege to coach and get the job Correct. done. Correct. Most are. <laughs> I did when I was coaching. <laughs> Um, people said to me, why are you getting a salary? I said, so I can spend it on the kids. I said, I don't coach for the mm. salary. And, uh, and I have to be <laughs> honest, these folks don't either. <laughs> I mean, a little bit helps, mm. but, uh, but it, it really isn't about the money. It's really about the student athletes and the passion they have for their sport. <clears throat> That's what it's about, the passion. Coaches are teachers. Yes, they, they are. are. Yes, they are. Absolutely. That's why it's the fifth block of the day, <laughs> is because they're coaches. Um, and then we had a young man who represented Keene High School all by himself at the indoor track championships. Mason Mann, he's a senior. He has since graduated. He won a state championship for boys at indoor track. And, uh, and that was interesting because we don't really offer indoor track. Okay, we don't, we don't have it as a sport. And you're capable of doing that if you register it with the NHIAA, you can register indoor mm -hmm. track. Uh, and he trained for this on his own. And then David Goldsmith went with him and represented him as his coach. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he competed and he took home the state championship in his event. That definitely shows character, self-motivation. Yeah. Self-motivation, he is right up there on that motivation chart. Uh, it was amazing. And when he came to <coughs> me and he said, I'd really like to do this, I was kind of like, what? We don't have indoor track. He said, well, I've been competing as an independent. And I said, okay. So I registered indoor track and off he went. It was good. And that's what you like from the young men and women. The, yes. You're talking about so the roadblock. Started, yeah. It's like, hey, I want to do this. This is, well, we don't have it. Well, let me find a way so I can do it. Right. And I won't embarrass you. I will work hard. Right. Actually, and he did. And, and <clears> it was... It was tremendous. It was a tremendous showing. All right. Then last spring, we had a new um, coach at girls lacrosse. Troy Emineth came in with his um, assistant coach, who is Ryan Schaefer, and uh, just did a tremendous job of moving that program forward. Absolutely. Um, they probably didn't finish in a win-loss column exactly where he would have liked them to, but I'm going to tell you, he brought that group together, Chris, as a team, okay? And they, they understand how to play lacrosse and they understand how to work together. And um, the interesting thing about Troy is that Troy is not a screamer. So Troy would simply be on the sideline and just pull them in and out and talk to them and send them back in and out and talk to them and send them back in, as opposed to a coach who, who stands on the sideline and is barking in a positive way, but barking through the whole game. No, no, Troy just stood there, and it was good. And I believe the girls had a great time, and they were so pleased that they were part of that selection committee. It's one of those. You can be Bobby Knight and successful, or right. you can be Joe Paterno and yep. successful. Right. I think I'd rather have my children right. with Joe Paterno. Yep. Right. <clears throat> and it depends. Uh, coaching styles, yep. you're never going to be able to, to hit anybody. every student <clears throat> athlete. Some are going to be like, oh, I wish they'd yell at me more. And some are going to be like, don't yell at me at all. Um, you can't do it. So you develop a style, you develop a philosophy, and you put it into action and see where it takes you. It was one of the things, being in the Marine Corps, <clears throat> you had some kids you'd have to go and put your hand around them and say, you got to do this, and they would um, react. Other ones that you would have to yell at, because if you, didn't, right. if you were too nice to them, they thought you didn't care. And, yeah. it's, and, and sometimes someone on the outside Saw it different. Saw it differently. So if you can, if I'm a parent that likes the calm approach, and all of a sudden I'm yelling at, at your son, and then all of a sudden you go to the principal and say how bad the coach is, but it's one of those standing outside or the other one, that, like, what's wrong with the coach? He's not yelling. He's yeah. not doing anything. Doesn't he's just standing him. there. Yeah. And so I think parents really have to tend to look at the whole picture and not just take a quick snapshot. Well, and, and that's really the mantra this year for Keene High School Athletics is um, we have a banner that's going to go up in the gym shortly as soon as, uh, as soon as we can get it up that says 
Keene High School where sportsmanship is an mm -hmm. expectation. So let the players play, the coaches <laughs> coach, the officials officiate, <coughs> and the spectators mm -hmm. be positive, okay. loud, proud, and positive with Blackbird pride. And, uh, and I talked about it through all the parent athlete meetings. I talked about it um, with the kids. I've talked about it with the coaches. And I'm really firm about it. I, I'm really firm that come as a spectator, watch the kids play, and cheer for them in a positive way. Don't officiate. Don't coach. And I'm sorry, but you're not on a team. And I tell the same thing to the kids. You're on a team. You're a player. Don't officiate. Don't coach. Play. Okay? And it seems to be going well. But all the things that we put into place last fall, um, preseason meetings with coaches, observations of practices, mid-season um, conferences, postseason conferences, evaluations, different types of evaluations, has really had a positive effect. I think it's really been good in linking together um, the athletic office not just me, but my admin assistant as well, and what the athletic office does to support and to help coaches. It's not a coach in the athletic office. It's a coach in the athletic office. I think the one thing they appreciate, there's some systems in there. Everything's the right. same. Uh, there's a timeline for everything. It's not hit or miss, and, and previously we didn't have that. Because <coughs> I was going to bring that up. When, when I first went on the school board, um, in 2000, 2001, 2002, you didn't really have an athletic department. You had almost like athletic kingdoms, team kingdoms. And kingdoms right. is a good term. That kingdoms is a good, is a good term. term. Yeah. That's an excellent and, term. Yeah. And it was. And there were moats. They were and there moats. Were, and there were big and fences. And it's like, I'm the number one king, so I'm getting the money for the yeah. uniforms and the equipment. Right. You're, <clears throat> you're a minor mm, prince, yeah. and you're not going to get it if right. there's something. That's changed drastically. Oh, it has, and especially with the implementation of the uniform rotation. Uh, this is the first fall that that has gone into effect, and I have to be honest. I negotiated uh, with Alan's help and support. We negotiated for football uniforms for this fall. Saved a lot of money. And we saved a lot of money, mm. and we did really well, and I really <laughs> like the way that worked. And uh, we have several more to do over the course of the year, and uh, it's going to be very exciting to watch how that, how that works. And um, so now I think the kids feel really good when they're in uniforms that they feel are really sharp and on the leading edge and representative of their sport. And um, <coughs> football is in a really sharp uniform. It's a black jersey with white letters and it's white pants and it has uh, the Blackbird logo on the left hip of the pants and it's really sharp. Um, soccer is now in, they're completely uh, NFHS compliant. When they play at home, they have to be in a solid white uniform, socks, shorts, yeah. and jersey, no stripes, no, no prints, nothing except perhaps <coughs> a logo, you know, a, a Keen High yeah. logo. And um, they both look really sharp because they're both 100% compliant. And we're a year early with that. So that's really, that's really good. One of, the, one of the benefits of the replacement we put in, it's five years. It's similar to the textbook uh, rotation we put in about... Uh, four years ago, it benefits both uh, the team and the players, and also it benefits the vendors because they know if they're not realistic mm -hmm. in their bid, they're going to be left out for the next five years. So I think we get a, we get a more <coughs> honest bid, we get better quality material, and I think everybody has ben benefited from it. And it, doesn't, it allows us to include our local vendors. All right. Um, local being, being vendors that we've done mm. business with for a number of years. And it also benefits those, <clears throat> the principality type teams yes. that sometimes like, well, those are not even the school uniforms anymore. Yeah. We did away with right. those 10 years ago, yeah. but, well, we can't afford you guys. Football's more important. Basketball's yeah. more yeah. important. Exactly. And if keen, if you're a keen student, you're a keen athlete, you're all supposed to be treated the same and valued yeah. the same. Exactly. And now they will be. Those little things like up-to-date uniforms yep. and other stuff. The um, this is off the um, on the other side is um, I've had a couple of them. Big things that go on concussions. And what are some of the um, the, the, the programs <clears throat> that you come in to help protect our, our students? 
Well, concussions is right now the hot spot nationally, all right? And it is a hot spot nationally because now they actually have research that's showing um, the repercussions of numerous concussions, particularly in the NFL. And they're just beginning to really be able to follow those and are they contributing to brain damage and early death and, and um, I'm going to call it special needs that develop as the player grows mm. older. We have a tremendous impact testing program that came to us through Dartmouth-Hitchcock and Tate Erickson. Mm. And also our results are being sent up to Dartmouth-Hitchcock and they're being in, in uh, Lebanon and they're being used in a study, okay, um, on a very confidential basis, no mm. numbers, just the tests, all right, so that they can actually analyze it and, and come back to us. Uh, we test every single student athlete that has a contact sport. Not just football. Not just football. Soccer. Like soccer. Soccer. We tested field hockey for field mm. hockey balls coming up in the face. Um, lacrosse. We test lacrosse. We test ice hockey. We test gymnastics, wrestling, swimming and diving. Um, not so much tennis. Jumpers in track and field. Baseball, softball. Mm. Uh, and it, it's really important. I will work really hard not to lose that program. I think it is crucial to the safety of our student athletes. And we've actually used it on some non-student athletes who have suffered a concussion outside of school, all right, just to, just to see if we can work with them and help them. The one thing about the impact testing is it's not the only diagnostic tool but it does allow our athletic trainers to take a student athlete who might have been three or four weeks off the field and put them back on in two if they're ready. But it also allows us to keep the student athlete who normally might have been back on in two off the field to their three or four if they're not ready. And um, we take it very seriously because a second or third or fourth concussion can take a normal individual and alter their life <clears throat> permanently. And it's not just a gut call anymore. No, it's not it's a gut <coughs> call. It's based on data. And it's based on, it's based on data and it's done by athletic trainers. It basically has taken it, athletic trainers, doctors, EMTs, it basically has taken that out of the hands of the coaches, which is good. And one, for example, you look at Sidney Crosby. Mm -hmm. yes. Great. Basically, he was talking about coming back last year. There's he a possibility not he might come back this year. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He may not come back, back at, at all. all. Eric Lindros. Mm -hmm. And the, I, I had suffered a number of concussions in, in the military. And um, the other part is I wasn't looking at the thing is I was an engineer and I was blowing up stuff. And it's, when I planned on it, it was the concussion effect on the other guys. And then he, we never thought about, Yourself. you know what, back on you, come man. back wow. on ourselves. And... Um, I had to go through a whole series of neuropsych. I did it um, a couple weeks ago. And you do all these tests, about four or five hours worth of testing, and then when it comes back and, you, and you're looking at the stuff, and it's kind of like, you say, wow. holy, holy yeah. crap. And it's kind of like, you, it's like the old um, Toby Keats song, where you think you're better than what you actually are. Right. But when, when you're taking all those tests and everything, and you're going... Oh, maybe that isn't just because I'm tired or whatever. It's the memory loss. Those are the memory yeah. losses, and it goes, oh yeah, this is where you, this is happening because you suffered a concussion in this part of the brain, <clears throat> and so, yeah, it has to be really serious if we're going to have sports. The community and the parents need to understand the importance of protecting us, our kids, from those concussions because you're right, two or three or even one bad room in the, in the one bad concussion in the long, wrong place can really have a life-altering life event. Mm -hmm. In addition to the equipment, <clears throat> it's also the proper progression of teaching the skills. Yes. Okay, Are you teaching it in the progression right. so that you're leading up? Um, my best example is taking someone <laughs> up to the, the top of a black diamond <laughs> on, on downhill skis and saying, oh, it's easy, <laughs> just kind yeah, of put them this far apart and turn them to the side. Okay, and they're like, oh, hello. Um, 
And, you know, they actually have changed the helmets for alpine skiing as well. They've made them so that now they must cover the ears instead of just being the bowl with the um, fabric here. It must cover. And when they do certain events, they actually have to wear a chin strap as well. Because, yeah, a lot of the concussion effect goes right yep. through the ears. Right. Right. And, right. Um, <clears throat> and so what a, the other one um, I think we discussed a little bit before, it was girls... ACLs seem to be more and more of a problem for, for girls with the ACLs. Well, they're getting better. And I'll be honest, we're about to really beef up our weight room at the high school. Uh, the Keen YMCA, when they move, mm -hmm. will be purchasing all new weight training equipment. And uh, we have the opportunity to purchase their former weight training equipment, and we're going to, and we're going to bring it out to the high school. And we're going to really add to our weight room. We're setting up a complete selected weight machine room, which is an annex to the weight room, um, and uh, as well as free weights, so we'll have those machines to use. And uh, we do a wonderful uh, conditioning, strength and conditioning workshop. Camp, it's almost mm. a camp in the summer with Chris Prue, former teacher at Keene State, now at um, Western New England, and he comes in and he and his assistants run this camp four days a week for six weeks and really work with the kids on this is how you run, this is how you hop, skip, jump, increase your agility, this is how you lift weights. It's been great. One of the things I like about um, <clears throat> Keene High School sports, and you were talking about Chloe, you're not funneling the kid into just one specific sport no. the Actually, whole time. No. We're trying I to encourage them to do yeah. more than one sport. Because it seemed like once, if you went through a number of different sports, <laughs> kids had less injuries, less back injuries, less knee mm -hmm. injuries. But now it seems for a while well, parents were going specifically one sport over training for one sport. But that, that may not be true because you may mm -hmm. experience injuries from overuse, use. from repetitive use, right. use from just, just one, one sport. sport. Okay, so you're actually not balancing out your body, all right? And um, we give a recognition at the end of the year to our seniors who are 12 season athletes right. who have participated four years, three seasons a year. And uh, in the year, past years, we've given them a, it's a, um, it says 12 season athlete <coughs> sweatshirt. And this year I have something <laughs> new in mind for them. But I think that's a huge accomplishment. Yep. And the interesting piece is I believe almost all of them were also scholar athletes in the seasons yeah. in which they participated. So some of them were also 12 season scholar athletes. Which is an amazing which accomplishment. Which is an amazing accomplishment um, by itself. I'll just bring one final one up. My, my pet peeve, and um, a lot of communities don't like <clears> to do it because they don't think it's beneficial or it uh, costs too much money. You don't have to answer me, but <clears throat> intramural programs. I just think intramural sports is really so important to the overall development of all the students because not everyone can go out in the athletic field. I have to tell you I agree. All right, and um, intramurals in the Keene school system between Keene Middle School and Keene High School are very strong and very different. At Keene Middle School, it's very organized. It's specific teams for specific sports, and they do them at specific times. At Keene High School, it's a little bit more open. It's certain days of the week from 2.05 to 3 o'clock, and the kids come in, and what they really want to do, they don't want to be quite as organized. We, we introduce <coughs> certain sports, like now they could do soccer or they could do this, but they really want it to be a little bit looser, structured, and hang out with their friends. Yeah. They want to be able to talk and play and have something to do after school. And many of them are student athletes mm. waiting to go to practice. And many of them are just kids that, that want to come in and, and they just want to shoot baskets for a while. They want to kick a soccer ball for a while. They want to throw a baseball, a softball, um, hit a tennis ball against the wall. Because down on um, Water Street, they had the basketball court. Right. And now they have lights. <clears throat> if you go down and watch those kids, they'll play until, until dark. They play until the lights go, go out. out. The lights yeah. go out, but if you go, there's no graffiti. No. There's no trash. And you would, if if people were to look at them and stereotype those kids 
going down on their skateboards or whatever, and they're going to say, oh, there's a bunch of troublemakers. Yeah. Yeah. But nope. they go in, there's no fights. Nope. It's basically, yeah, they're playing ball. It's, it's loose, and they self-police. They do. And, and I think that's, what, that's another part of athletics. It doesn't have to be totally organized. The kids are getting along, no violence, no crime, and they're staying healthy. Mm -hmm. Right. And people ask us about our intramural program at, at Keene High School <coughs> and why doesn't it offer this and this and this? Because the kids don't, don't want, want that. Right. They don't want it. It's student-centered. And I have to be honest, I like it when it's student-centered. So um, we got about a minute left. There's anything you want to hit that we didn't touch about? About the middle school? <laughs> The middle school, we were going to, um, I guess we can save that a little bit to later because they okay. have some really great facilities. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'm pretty sure that you, the high school will be able to start using some in there in the future. Well, we're going to, we're going to actually sit down and discuss that, uh, Joe Bob and Eric Cress and myself, within the next couple of weeks. Okay, about sharing usage of facilities as we have. We are currently sharing mm -hmm. usage of our facilities with the middle school because their fields um, aren't quite ready for action mm. yet. Because they got a beautiful track out there. Yes, they yes, do. They do. <laughs> yes, they do. They have a beautiful track. Well, I want to thank both of you for being out here. Well, thank, thank you very much for asking yeah. us. And um, I hope the parents understand and the community understands the benefit of what they, you guys do for their kids and your fellow coaches. And so hopefully we'll be out again when we get ready for the, the spring season. Sure. And so... I can't think of his name. The, your baseball coach that retired? Tom Fowler. Tom Fowler. Yep. He retired from teaching, teaching but, but not from baseball. from baseball. Right. Okay. Good. I wanted to make sure. Yep. Yeah. Retired yeah. from teaching, teaching, but not from baseball. <clears throat> so, again, thank you. We'll see you on the long road, and we'll track down Tom Fowler this spring. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.